You're listening to Atoms, Motion, and the Void. Night Stories, a wonderful program of stories and music that rivals the moon in radiance. Chapter 1, The Great Achievement. Part 2, I've done the best I can, yeah. And soon I'll make it home, dear I try to find my way, clear I'll try again tonight, dear I stand upon the moonlight of a sin And catch the wailing laughter of the wind no one's there, you can't go home again From once upon a time until the end A note on terminology To explain why I call the great achievement the great achievement Let us say that a certain someone does a certain something She builds a skyscraper single-handedly Perhaps it would take a century and working Saturdays and Sundays, early starts, late finishes, more than a shovel, clearly. But let us imagine it. Now let us say that when our skyscraperess finishes the job, she stands alone upon its most upness, at that mighty point of scraping anyway. If she is the only one on earth, or she has somehow managed to build her skyscraper without detection, somehow secretly, would it still be a great achievement? A wonderful, eccentric, personal accomplishment, certainly. But I would say that a thing only really becomes an achievement when it is observed. An achievement is not an achievement without a witness. Which is to say that I call my great achievement a great achievement because I had a witness. I was observed throughout by a sixteen or seventeen-year-old girl in a sackcloth. As there was a certain degree of coldness to this observation, I would prefer to say that I was monitored. Each step of the way, she monitored me. If I had not myself monitored her back, we might prefer to say that she spied upon me. But I knew she was there. In fact, it was strangely the case that I was the spy in this circumstance, as I don't believe she knew that I knew that she was monitoring me. Thus, she monitored, I spied. And yet her observation of what otherwise might simply have been a wonderful, eccentric, personal accomplishment is the reason I feel compelled to call the great achievement a great achievement. Before a little music... A note on notes on terminology. There will be more of these notes along the way. Notes on terminology, always accompanied by the sound of the bell I extracted from my toaster, that we not fall off into the shadows of misunderstanding. Because, my friends, we shall soon enter such murky waters that the need will arise to shore up our position every now and then to keep one visible foot on the ground as the other flies off into the skies. Let us now rest clearly in music. Let's pause to clear our minds. Never mind, it's harder than filling up rooms. It's hard to clear our minds. Clearly it's something we'd rather not do Here's another note on terminology It helps to do hard things with bells from your toaster Here's another note on terminology It helps to do hard things with bells from your toaster One foot on the ground, one in the sky, let's pause to clear our minds. 
For many years, I have made use of a Mr. Postman's Perfect Toast Toaster, a single-slot toaster which vaguely resembles a mailbox. It sits, or sat, upon a wooden post, and one fed a slice of bread into the front slot as though depositing a letter to a loved one. When bread became toast, a friendly bell would ring, and a pleasing red flag would pop up to signal the smoky, fundamental victory. I can honestly say that my experience consuming toast prepared by the Mr. Postman, especially after setting a perfect stamp of butter in an upper corner of its browned envelope, was as close as I've ever gotten to eating my own mail. But very like my bedside clock, the Dundee elect Tick Tock Junior stuck forever at the time of 618, or, unlike it, or perhaps exactly like it, the Mr. Postman one day ceased to function. It is very possible that I once more misperceived its state and had managed an inadvertent plug-tugging. But let us assume, in the light of my wish to not seem frivolous, unobservant, and bumbling, that my Mr. Postman simply perished after a long life of burning up my personal correspondence. And to get that out of our minds, let us now take a moment to forget that the Dundee was simply unplugged, and that the Mr. Postman may have been too. When my Mr. Postman died, I found myself unwilling to give up my familiar, friendly mailman. A few toastless days passed, and I grew hungrier and hungrier, and I ate a bit of butter here and there. Now, I am not a man who exclusively eats butter or inclusively remembers his dreams, but I began in these bit of butter days to dream and dream of toast, and how to once more make it with my defunct Mr. Postman. In the dreams, I was always at the window, peering into my kitchen as a girl of sixteen or seventeen in a sackcloth, first opened my Mr. Postman to strip away its electronics and plastic bits, its bell and red flag and the cord and heating element and so on, and when this was done, I watched as she slid a slice of bread into the slot, and therewith tossed the entire silver mailbox of my Mr. Postman into the wood fire. After a few moments, she retrieved it from the fire with my log tongs, withdrew her toast, buttered it, and, oh, so very nearly ate it. Of course, I woke at this most delicious moment. I had this dream several times before realizing I was meant to take it under advisement and actually embark on this self-same experiment myself. The primary aim of the curious chore, as I saw it, was twofold. To satisfy my hunger, while also discovering whether a solution delivered by dream stood a chance of successful application. I had no wonder, at the outset, as to the character of this sixteen- or seventeen-year-old girl in the sackcloth. If there is a question here, the answer is yes. A Mr. Postman performs quite admirably as a tossable cook-stove. I remove the parts, as per my dream, and put the red flag and the bell in my pocket, to be used at such times when I either wish to personally raise a friendly flag, or take a side-step with an occasionally necessary note on terminology. I was once more with toast, and I had a helpful bell and a friendly flag in my pocket. In fact, I considered my Mr. Postman to have bettered its lot, as it now produced the best-tasting toast I had ever eaten. Of course, yes, my Mr. Postman now looked like a black hell-box, something the devil himself might use to store an assortment of rocks or villain-knuckles. And yet, 
we two carried on, man and postman. Unlike the Dundee, which transcended itself, the Mr. Postman had gone primitive, and had become, to my way of thinking, more vitally itself, a purer, naturally superior version, the perfect mailman. It was after a few days of being back in toast and no longer perishing that I began to wonder of the girl in my dream. Who was she? Why was she there? And I'm not sure why my thinking leapt in this direction, but it occurred to me that while I had watched her from the window in the dream, perhaps she was watching me from the window in reality. And so each time I tossed my Mr. Postman in the fire, I would glance sidelong, as peripherally as possible, turning my head in the wrong direction while scanning my eyes for the window. And indeed, I caught the slimmest sight of her, a length of hair, a fingertip, with the corner of my eye, I caught the corner of hers. More dreams that featured the girl were forthcoming, dreams whose bidding I felt inclined to follow. In one, I watched the girl drag my pillow and blanket out of my cabin and into the woods. I followed her through the forest, careful to hide behind trees, as now and then she would stop suddenly and leap around as though to catch me but I was always too fast. Finally, she came upon a talus field on the western slopes of Market Mountain and began to climb over the rubble and rock piles until dropping down into the quagmire of a cave. I could not, in the dream, go further without detection, and so I sat nearby, rather loudly, upon a rock for some time. In fact, I have never more loudly sat I was not certain until later what dream purpose might be served by such a tremendous noise from so slight a thing, but it sounded as though a hammer had struck stone. <coughs> Following the dissolve of this loud sitting, I next heard the sounds of snoring, and knew at once that the girl in the sackcloth had fallen asleep in the cave. To honor the success of the Mr. Postman dream, which had kept me alive, so I liked to generously suppose, I thought I might embark on a little one-night adventure, and follow the blinking cursor of this latest dream. If a cave could be found in the location marked in the dream, I felt a noble obligation to make use of it. And so that night I took my pillow and my blanket from cabin to forest. Here and there, at no instigation other than honoring that which I had seen, I suddenly stopped and twirled about to see if the girl might be following me. I did not see her, but then again, in the dream, she had not seen me. Finally striding and stumbling over the rocks of the talus field, and with somewhat horrible ease, I found the cave. I would say that my mood at that moment was reluctantly overjoyed. I did not want to sleep there. I could not wait to sleep there. I climbed down into its warm, dark mouth and was almost instantly, almost magically, asleep. But right before I departed consciousness, I heard the sound of hammer on stone, <coughs> the sound of someone sitting down just outside the cave. The girl, I knew, was there. You're a time I want to. You're a time I need to. There's no one for me who wants only you. You're a night I play the broken pieces of the day Every night I lay down in pieces Every time I want to Every time I need to 
There's no one for me who wants only Lou. Other dreams. I watched her throw the Mr. Postman in the fire, and then throw the log tongs in the fire, and then throw my bread in the fire, and let them burn. I did this as well, again in a state of overjoyed reluctance. I watched her kneel in the mud and drink from a stream, and therewith became a mud kneeler, a stream drinker myself. I watched her eat mushrooms and wild berries and a strange kind of grass, and soon my diet was nothing but these. What she did in dreams, I did in reality. These were the developing features of the great achievement, and my ever-going mood was always that same, overjoyed, reluctance, keen resistance, keen desire. What began as a disentanglement from time with the breaking of my clock moved into at first a primitive celebration of my toast and a reliance on fire, soon became a repudiation of these, until I found myself in full separation from money, from my home, from my every familiar way. I was gone wild in the least wild way, as I took to living now in the cave, eating the what-have-yous of the field, drinking the silver stream water. And she would watch me from the forest, from the stone, from behind trees, and I would catch only the subtlest glimpse of her, her black hair, her dirty sackcloth, a bright finger curled against the bark. Now you may consider the rough movement of living in this way a great degradation, not a great achievement. But consider, I had been slowly teased away from every familiarity by a girl in my dreams, who yet persisted in my reality. Very like my Mr. Postman and my Dundee Electric Talk Junior, I had been unplugged. I had been elevated by falling into the primitive. It was only when the dreams of the girl ceased that a desire to make her acquaintance made its way inside me. It felt a foreign element, this want, as though wanting it too much might soon deliver me back to my cabin, where I'd be liable to plug my dundee in, buy a new toaster, and once more sleep in my old bed. But I was curious as well to find out the true authorship of the great achievement. Was it me? Was it her? Was it us together? Could I find out what lay behind such a never-before-considered curtain of this life, discover who she was, and not suffer some redound, some uncharming return to the ritual of my steady former incongruity? And content as I was, it seemed impossible to me, unforgivable, that I not next trespass upon that wind, follow and find the girl, make her acquaintance, and discover what? Who she was? Who I was? How she had managed her way into my dream? It seemed larger than that, smaller, a story, not a truth, a taste of something that had no flavor, a discovery of something that I'd always known. The sound of a song I had always been singing. Lord, 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 hallelujah. Everything I love has blown away. She lived down near the railroad tracks At the top of the hill by the black smoke stacks In a rough little house all the windows were cracked didn't have any clothes, but she sewed up a sack I used to play piano at the old town hall There was never a crowd, in fact, no one at all But one day at the end of a sad little song I saw the girl in the sackcloth singing along 
She's saying, Lord, 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 hallelujah. Everything I love, it's blown away. listening to Atoms, Motion, and the Void. For more information on the show, please visit my website at radioghost.com. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>